All right, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, continue here, and we're going to get more controversial tonight. And um, what we're doing is looking at four different prominent views of the rapture, of the tribulation, of the end times. Now, we're, we're kind of hanging here with pre-tribulational rapture. Um, that's the view that I have and probably most of us here have, if not everyone. And we want to look at these passages here first because most of the other positions will not take such a literal view, a normal reading of the scriptures like this, and understand it this way. Um, as we've mentioned before, the pre-tribulational rapture is a, a futuristic view, a futurist view of the end times, and it's the only view that takes the Bible literally. Every other view will chalk it up to figurative language or symbolism. So, um, what seems reasonable to do, since we read the rest of the Bible normally and literally right, let's look at this doctrine, this teaching of the scripture, and look at it literally and normally, and see if it holds up. And then, um, as we hold that up under a literal lens, if somebody's going to come along and say, no, that's figurative language, they've got to have a good reason for it. And so, when we start getting into amillennialism, or maybe, you know, it's people who say there is no rapture, and you look at post-tribulation and things like that, let's see if there's good precedence for saying, no, we, we need to take this over pre-trib. This makes sense over pre-trib, pre-mill, because. So let's let's say it's figured out. So we're going we're gonna to hold it up to, we're going to hold all those other views, perspectives up to a literal translation first. So with that in mind, um, we kind of looked at last week, in the little example first of when we use the word book in different ways, if you can look at that word book and understand it as something different depending on how it's used. And um, here's another one of those words um, that we come into, apostasia in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And normally we understand that word, it's been transliterated into English and we use it as apostasy, having to do with um, somebody who's left the faith, um, left our left sound doctrine, and they've become apostates. But apostasia itself is not a word that even really means that. And as it says here, um, the word means departure or departing. So how do we get here? Well, and another example of this aside from last week using the word book and how you can use it, is um, baptize or baptism, okay? That's been transliterated from the Greek. But um, the word baptize means to dip. So in the English, I mean, when we use baptizing or to baptize, we don't call it to dip or a dipping. Because if we did, you probably wouldn't have people sprinkling and pouring. So it's just one of those words that have been transliterated in a way that it has confused the language and the use of the word. And this is possibly another example of that. So, um, before we quite get there, well, no, let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and look at, at 2 Thessalonians 2 and um, look at the first, uh, let's say, say the first three verses and see what the controversy is and then go, go in and... and um, Jump in up to the kneecaps here at least. Um, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless... The falling away, or apostasia, comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Um, 
apostasia, which means departure. Does that word apo look familiar? Apo means um, has to do with separation, being separated. So in apostasia, part of that root meaning of that word means to be separated. So when you depart, there's a separation that goes on. Um, so context determines uses, of, as we've discussed. Here's the interesting thing about this word, because normally the way we understand it in modern English, ever since the King James Bible, we've understood it as in some translations will say falling away. Um, there, there must be a falling away first, like the translation I just now read. Does anybody have something different from unless the falling away comes first? Rebellion. Rebellion, that's a common one. Yeah, that's, that's another common one. Let's see if those are justified. This is why we uh, exposit scriptures. This is why we get into the original language and look at lexicons and things like that so we can find out if it's being used right. Um, again, all it means is departure. So are they justified in, in calling it the falling away if all it is is in the original Greek it says that day will not come unless the departure comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is very controversial, and I, for the longest time I vacillated, not been really sure of it. I thought it was kind of a novel thing, and I chewed on it for a long time. I came across some papers about it and read it, and then I started digging in deeper, so I'm just going to put this all out there, and you all can come to your own conclusions. But um, I think it's, a, it's really interesting. It's really fascinating to look at considering some of the evidence here that we see. Um, almost all uses of the context of these passages that use this word um, or, or share their root word with it has to do with um, a, departing, a departure from something, depart from. So we're going to open up some of those verses and read them, and, and I'll show you what it means. This passage here just uses the word, and it doesn't say depart from anything, like depart from the faith or anything like that. So the, the Greek noun form of apostasia, um, it's only used twice in the New Testament this way, in, in its noun form, only twice. Um, in addition to 2 Thessalonians 2.3, it's also in Acts 21.21. 21. If you want to look there or make a note, Acts 21, 21, we can see the other place where it's used, the, the noun form is used like this. Um, Paul, speaking of Paul, it said that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake apostasia, Moses. So see there, uh, the word forsake is to depart. So they're not saying the Jews who are among the Gentiles just departing. They're departing from something, and they're departing from Moses. So the accusation is you're teaching the Gentiles to depart from the ways of Moses. So it's from something, like the Mosaic Law. Okay. So there's always a from attached to it. So the Greek word is uh, apo, which means from... Um, or to create separation, is stemi to stand. Um, thus it has the core meaning of away from or just plain departure. Um, the verb for form can mean to remove it away spatially in terms of distance. So there's little reason then to deny that the noun can mean such as spatial removal or departure. Since the noun is used only one other time in the New Testament, and that has to do with apostasy from Moses in Acts 21, 21, as we said. So um, of these, let's see, the verb is used 15 times in the New Testament. And here's an interesting statistic, the reason why we're going into all this, okay, if you hang with me. Uh, of these 15, only three have anything to do with the departure from the faith at all. So the word 
apostasia can mean a departure or a separation from anything, not just from the faith. So, if we look at some of these here, I want to... There are... Let's see. The word is used for departing from iniquity in 2 Timothy 2.19. So it talks about separating apostasia from iniquity. So it's not just separating from the faith. So what I want us to consider is, is it fair to use it as a... Um, in the end, there must be an apostasy before the, the man of sin comes. Is it fair to say that it has to do with being this big apostasy or separation from the faith? Is that fair? Based on how it's used elsewhere. It's the same word used elsewhere all the time, just like last week we were looking at the word book. The word book can mean any number of things, depending on how it's used, right? Um, separate from ungodly men. In 1 Timothy 6, 5, Luke 2, 27 talks about being separated from or apostasy from, uh, apostasia from the temple. And 2 Corinthians 12, 8 talks about separation from the body. And in Acts 12, 9, or see, 12, 10, in Luke 14, talks about apostasia or departure from persons, separating from per persons, so departing from persons. So with that in mind, let me again read the first three verses of 2 Thessalonians 2, and you guys tell me. I know I'm jamming all this stuff in your head, but I want you to consider that the word departure means departure, and it doesn't always mean... Um, falling away from the faith. So now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the departure comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So it's a lot to chew on, isn't it? What do you think? I mean, it's okay if you're not willing to commit to that yet. It's, it's new and it's <laughs> different because you're used to, well, my version says, and like it says here on the slide here, um, the first seven English translations of apostasia before the King James all rendered the noun either as departure or departing. So you had the Wycliffe Bible in 1384, Beza Bible in 1583, the Geneva Bible in 1608, the Coverdale Bible in 1535, Breaches in 1576, um, Tyndale in 1526, you had the Kramer Bible in 1539, or Cranmer, however you pronounce it, in 1539, and uh, they all used the word departure. And then King James came along and they used apostasia as falling away, and then that created the confusion. From then on, some translations started changing as the popularity of the King James Bible began to increase. So I, you can see how that created a lot of confusion. So how do we have these seven tra well-translated scriptures, um, these versions, English versions, and they're all using departing until we get to King James and then things start changing a little bit. A little odd, isn't it? So it makes you wonder. So we have to, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to look at it a little bit in context and see if that's which is justified, right? Because right now you might be thinking, hmm, that's insufficient information. I don't know. That's that's kind of weird. In fact, um, Jerome's Latin translation, known as the Vulgate, you've probably all heard of the Latin Vulgate, right? Um, from around the time of A.D. 400, renders apostasia with the word 
decessio, meaning departure. So that's the way they rendered it in Latin. Same thing, departure. One time where the word apostasy, just one time, clearly means um, a departure from the faith. And it's just in this one verse. It's an important verse. We should all be familiar with it. 1 Timothy 4. And I recommend turning there. And let's read it. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. We all have heard this passage, I think. Now the Spirit speaks expressly, says that in the latter days, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. So, as we have up there in verse 1, depart from the faith. That's the word that we're looking at here. Some will depart from the faith. So they always, in all these passages, except for 2 Thessalonians and the one in Acts, they'll always have a departure from something. This is the only time it talks about departure from the faith. So somehow we imprint that in, in the last times there's going to be this apostasy that has to do with... Here's the thing that's, that's going on now. Let's, when we consider context, what's going on with the letter to the Thessalonians? And I want to look at some more passages in Thessalon Thessalonians too. Both these letters are a response that have to do with end times. I think the first three chapters are mostly Paul just talking generally and greeting and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't really get into the body of, of the end times and all that until about chapter 4 of the first letter. Is that apostasy the same original root word as in Thessalonians? Yeah. Okay. Yep, it is. Because mine has it as in the Strong's light, has it as apistame? Apistame. Yeah, it's thanks. I know it's, <laughs> it's the yeah. word that apostasia is derived from. So okay. they have you'll a have a noun version. Have a common root. Yeah, you'll have a noun version, you'll have a verb version, that kind of a thing. Apistame. Yeah. Thanks for pronouncing that better than me. <laughs> Now, My semester of Greek didn't go the way. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> now the the verses I have written here will use basically that word um, apostasy, apostasia, and they're all a departure from something. I, I think they're all using apostemi, not necessarily apostasia. Right. Because that word's only like used twice in the Bible, apostasia. Yeah, yeah the Acts 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. yeah. Different form in the Greek. So, somehow, this got imprinted on, on first or 2 Thessalonians 2, which is interesting and a little bit unfortunate. You'll see similar will happen too with 2 Peter 3 will get imprinted somehow as like from Revelation. You know, everything being consumed in a fire and melting with a fervent heat in the, you know, the everything, the atmosphere, the sky is rolling up like a scroll and all that kind of stuff. But yet you get into the book of Revelation and it's, where's that big event? That's a big event. So Paul, when he's writing to the Thessalonians, a few things are happening. There's there is some confusion about the end times. And Paul, in his first letter, goes into the end times. And, and he's trying to clear up a lot of confusion over this. And the Jews in particular were creating a lot of confusion for them. And then somewhere along the line, too, people came along and tried to say, oh, you missed it. And, you know, when they're, and they're wondering, they're confused, they're saying, we missed, we missed what? You know, and then they're concerned about their departed loved ones and this kind of thing. Are they, did they miss the boat? Are they going to, are they going to hell? Are they going to, what's going on? And what's this? So there was all kinds of confusion, all kinds of different positions or perspectives that you can imagine. They were going through their heads and they were trying to think through these scenarios and try to figure out 
what exactly the Lord is, is doing and what the meaning is. So the word got back to Paul, so he wrote a second letter to try to clear this up a little bit more. So what I thought would be good is, is for the sake of context here, because it all informs 2 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it all kind of informs, in the form of context, it informs how we should understand this word apostasia. Does it mean a departure? <clears throat> Here's part of the thing. Paul is talking about signs and, and some big events that are going to happen, and, and he'll talk about, hey, none of this is going to happen until the man of sin is revealed first. But one of the things he mentions as one of the big signs is, that, I mean, that's, that's a big deal, right? Because you talk about the man of sin and you're talking about the temple. Okay, and then later on the temple is destroyed. So we're talking about a yet future temple. So that's a pretty big sign there. Man of sin, the temple's going on. Oh yeah, Jesus talked about that on Olivet and talked about, you know, the abomination of desolation. Oh, I see how that works with, you know, Daniel chapter 9 now. So they, these Christians are thinking this. Okay, so... That's a big sign. Now, is departing from the faith a big sign? Not really, because people are doing it all the time. All the time we've been reading about this. In New Testament days, they're talking about how everybody's always departing from the faith. There's, it's been happening constantly. It was happening in you know, 1 John 2. Lots of scriptures about departing from the faith, right? So that's not really a big sign. That's like an everyday thing. It's kind of like talking about the Antichrist and this temple and some new churches are going to be founded too. You go, know, what? New churches are pop up every day. So it'd be kind of like a weird thing to throw in there. Some people are going to leave the faith, depart from the faith. You know, it was, you know, so. And only some translations would put it rebellion. Kenneth Weist, for instance. Um, I have Weist. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see how he does it. He does a departure. Let's look at, take a deeper dive into 2 Thessalonians 2. So here's an interesting thing that happens here. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away or the departure comes first. First, it's interesting what ha what happens is first is the word proton, so it's the first in order of events. So the departure would happen, and then the man of sin is revealed, to be, or the son of perdition would be um, the next thing that would happen. So verse 3 talks about a departure, and verse 3 talks about the man of sin, son of perdition. So one happens first, the departure happens, and then the man of sin or the son of perdition is revealed. If we look down at verses 6 and 7, let's take a look at that. Let me flip back. Um, speaking of the man of sin being revealed, the son of perdition, verse 4 says, describes him, says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So Paul is reminding them of his former visit. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So it's kind of an order of events. So what he's done in verse 3 as he talks about the departure and the man of sin, describes the man of sin a little bit, and then he kind of 
restates a similar type of a thing, only this time it's verses 6 and 7, it talks about the restrainer being taken. Um, and notice the restrainer is a he. Sometimes people will try to say the restrainer can be any number of strange things, but it's a he. Well, here's the thing with, with the church, is if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit ain't going without us. Because we're sealed in the Holy Spirit, well, right? Well, it's also that taken out of the way doesn't mean removed as much as taken aside, moved out of the way. So I, I don't think the Holy Spirit will depart the earth when the church does, because otherwise who could be saved yeah. during the tribulation? Right. Well, he just stopped. He just stops raining or you know, restraining. Right. So he's taken out of the way from. He moved out of the way. Right. But as we know, is is God is um, omnipresent, and He's not going to completely leave the earth. There's no place, to, even if, as David said, if I make my bed in hell, you're with me. That kind of thing. So no matter where you go, the Holy Spirit's there. Is that rain? Mm-hmm. Yep. It's supposed to. Oh. I wasn't expecting that. So what? At first I heard a little bit and I thought it was leaves blowing. Okay. So then the, the man of sin or the lawless, lawless one is, is revealed. So here Paul has given the same order as he did in verse 3 where the, so the departure and the restrainer is taken. And then here the man of sin or the lost one is revealed. So that's the order of events. So that day, okay, in that day, what day? Verse 1 says, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's, that's the day. So the departure is first and then the man of sin is revealed. So who is the man of sin? Well, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself he is God, which is, I think is interesting. He's showing himself he is God, so he's kind of convincing himself this way. Not that everybody else will necessarily believe it. In fact, we know what eventually ends up happening is the remnant of Jews, Israel, Eventually, we'll see the abomination of desolation that he kind of recreates in his own way in the future, and uh, they definitely will stop believing in him at that point, and they'll repent. So there'll be a big revival in, in Israel when that happens. So, so when is the man of sin revealed? That's another key question. So after the departure... Yet before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, yet while there's still a temple for him to stand in, so that fits what Daniel 9 says and Matthew 24 says, the event happens in the middle of the week. The week is a a period of seven, right? So three and a half years in. Okay, so trying to drill this down a little bit more closely. So when is the man of sin destroyed? And verse 8 gives us that clue because it says, um, destroyed with the brightness of his coming, which is what? It's at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Let's see if I can pull this up here. Um, So how long is the, the man of sin revealed? Um, Daniel 9, 20 to 27. If you want to go to Daniel 9, this is a a key passage that everybody should know who's going to be studying in times, and we will get into it more, but uh, not tonight. Okay, so Daniel 9, he's in this big prayer with the Lord, and verse 20, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, 
uh, before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand at the beginning of your supplications. The command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. All right, so hold on to your hats. He's, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but he <coughs> essentially, I guess we are going to go through the whole thing. <laughs> he essentially is giving... I just want to say welcome to my life today. Yeah, he's giving the whole panoply of history briefly to Daniel, and it leaves Daniel troubled for a long time, for many days, okay? Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even the trouble, even in troublesome times. Verse 26, And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant, or an agreement, or a contract, with many for one week. So there's your period there of a seven years and in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering which means there's got to be a temple there right and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes it desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate clear as mud right <laughs> it's a difficult passage and people have debated it and talked about it and tried to sort through it and many different ways um, over the years and, and um, some people still argue about some of the meanings of some of that passage. But the main thing we get out of that though is, is we're looking at a one week period and the man of sin is there for the whole week. So you've got, you, the only conclusion you can come to is there's some type of departure that also involves the restrainer taken and you've got the man of sin, son of perdition, who is the lawless one, and he's revealed. So one happens, and then the other happens. Let's see here. If I can make this behave. Awesome. So before the man of sin is revealed, the restrainer is taken. If the restrainer goes, we go, as we said. The man of sin is revealed after the departure and before the second coming. The man of sin is here for a full week of years, or seven years. Therefore, pre-tribulation departure or rapture. So if you tie them all together like that. Because the man of sin is going to be here for a whole week. And if he's going to be here for the whole week and there's some type of a departure or the restrainer's taken, we're still talking about all these things have to happen. And Paul's, the tenor of Paul's language is, is um, basically, um, hey, don't worry about it. Because this departure's got to happen first and then the man of sin is revealed and he's going to be here for a whole seven years. So it sounds like Paul's talking about a pre-tribulation rapture either way, right? Because he's talking about a seven-year period, man of sin, and he's here for that whole week, and in the middle of the week, he uh, stands up in the temple, declares himself to be God, tells himself he's God, tries to convince everybody he's God, 
we know from Revelation later on that he puts up this image, or the at least the false prophet does, for him to be worshipped. And um, that's kind of... So let's take more of a look at Thessalonians, okay? So as we get more, that tells us, as I said, we're looking at, we're trying to figure out, is this justified to say that we can understand departure to mean preterm rapture? So part of that's going to be looking at context, the context of the letters what Paul's writing in, right? Have I lost you all yet? Is it, is it too confusing? Question so far? It's confusing, huh? That part of it is. Okay, we'll, we'll pull it all together now because now we got a little bit of time. We're going to go through some more familiar verses because we want to do it in context, right? Because context determines the meaning. Um, 100% of the time. <laughs> you know, but sometimes we can figure, out, figure it out without context. But Okay, so... Paul is praying for the church. Like I said, first three chapters, Paul is talking about who he's praying for, and he's greeting people, and he's talking about conditions of the world or whatever. So then, finally, in, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you, are, uh, you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, sanctification has to do with holiness, right? And walking toward Christ, pursuing Christ, the way we live our Christ, separated for God. Not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outstanding, and that you may lack nothing." This theme comes up regularly when it comes to end times and holiness. They're connected a lot, and they're connected in, in uh, 1 John 3 as well and other passages. Um, you could argue that it happens in Matthew 25 about being ready when the Master comes and how you're conducting yourself. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, which means what? Died. 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 Yeah, I really just got that. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Hope means expectation. We have this like expectation of seeing the Lord again and seeing our brethren again, right? Unbelievers do not. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, here's where we get into some key verses here. This is a passage where people who do not believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, they don't particularly like this particular passage, but they will ask you, they'll challenge you and say, where does it talk about a pre-trib rapture in the Bible? But this is another one of those passages. We went over a couple before, like Revelation 3.10 and a couple others. But this is where we're going to start mounting up on some of these verses and, and learning them well enough that we can articulate what it says and where that belief comes from. Okay, so, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 
and what happens. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, okay, now, so hold on. We have other passages like Revelation 19, right? Revelation 19 does not talk about us jumping up and meeting the Lord together in the clouds there. We're meeting and he comes down and he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and it splits and all that kind of stuff. So you see the difference there. Second coming, all the passages about the second coming are um, passages like in Revelation 19 where we come back with the Lord. We return with the Lord. And then we've got New Jerusalem coming down, which is going to be our new home. So Jesus comes down and we're coming down with him. Here, we're meeting the Lord in the clouds. So these are two different events. And we gave you that chart already that gave you, the, I think, the comparisons of uh, rapture versus second coming and how they're distinct. Okay, so let's continue. Any questions about that so far? Um, write down Isaiah 26. And if we don't get a chance to get into there tonight, I, I want you to look at it and we'll bring it back again. Isaiah 26 is an interesting passage in the Old Testament that kind of echoes some of this. So when you get a chance. Okay, so Paul talking about the end still. Remember, we're leading, we're trying to lead up to this second letter here where he clarifies what this what he's saying at this time. So he says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a, as a thief in the night. Now let's pause there a second. What's the day of the Lord? It's coming. It's coming. But specifically, what does that look like? Well, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord usually refers to his judgment. Yeah. The day of the, day of the Lord, um, the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, the great and terrible day of the Lord. The yeah. terrible the day of the day of God and all that. has to do with, you know, wrath and judgment. The time of tribulation that Jesus spoke about, too, talks about that. And, and day does not mean, it can, but context, day doesn't mean a 24-hour period. It means this period, this time. So, tribulation is the day of judgment of God on an unbelieving world, but it consummates on the very last day when his foot actually comes down and you have the grapes of wrath and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be, there's a day of reckoning. It, it reaches its pinnacle. It consummates ultimately at the second coming. Um, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Um, here's a question. If we know the second coming and we've been described the second coming many times, he's coming in the clouds and brightness and glory and all of this. Um, and Jesus and other passages talk about the middle of the week. These things happen. The Antichrist is here for a week, seven-year period. In the middle of the week, this happens. Where Okay, so if in the middle of the week, the Antichrist stands up in the temple, says, worship me, kind of a thing, then you have how many years left? Three and, three and a half. Three and a half. So how are you caught like a thief in the night? If there is no rapture and tribulation, it's all figurative language and so forth. You know, at least from the middle of the tribulation down to just about the day when Jesus is coming back. So who's getting caught like a thief? Well, the day of the Lord, again, refers to not just the second coming, but this whole seven-year period of judgment. Now, he comes like a thief. What's being stolen? What does a thief do? Is it going to catch? Are, are we caught horribly by surprise and it's going to be an ugly bad thing like we've been ripped off because he comes like a thief? We're that which is stolen. 
The bride of Christ is taken, taken away. We are salt and light. The Holy Spirit, his restraining is taken away. Evil and judgment fall upon the world. So that's who gets caught like a thief in the night as the unbeliever. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Now you'll start seeing this in this letter, a lot of us and them type of language. Okay, so don't miss that. As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Doesn't that contrast with Revelation 3.10 that we've already covered that says that you will escape as a church, right? See the contrast there? Us and them. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day shall overtake you as a thief. You are all sons or children of light and children of the day. That'd be a great name for a band, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm kidding, because it was a band back in the 70s. <laughs> um, that's, I'm aging myself here. Old Calvary Chapel stuff. Um, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, and we see the word therefore. It's a good thing that's why we read the verses before, right? Therefore... Let us not sleep as others do. Again, we're emphasizing holiness and watching, right? But let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. So we're talking about day and night type things, light and dark, okay, saved and unsaved. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love and the helmet and hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation, which the word salvation in this context means deliverance, because we're already saved. He's talking to the church, right? So the word salvation is deliverance. Okay, salvation from the wrath to come. He's, that's the context here. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we're awake or asleep, we should live together with him. Therefore... Comfort one another and edify one another just as you are doing. So he's telling us to comfort one another and build one another up. So if we're expecting to go into the tribulation period, that would be an absurd statement, wouldn't it? Comfort one another with this. Are you kidding me? I need an instruction manual. I want to know how I'm going to survive. But no, to the church, he's giving, using this us and them language. And then he closes out the letter and with more greetings and so forth and encouragement. So, in context, we zip right into 2 Thessalonians where he had to clarify some things because some folks came along and tried to say, oh man, you guys missed it. <laughs> First thing I'd be saying is, oh really? What are you doing here then? <laughs> what does that say about you? Um... So chapter one, I mean, let's, may as well do it real quick. Uh, he's, he's greeting me in verse one and two. Verse three says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, the word tribulations means troubles, of course, and some people who don't believe that in even a, a literal tribulation or whatever, they, they will try to say, um, see, there's tribulation all the time. That's already happened. They had tribulation back in 70 AD. That was when that period was. It's troubles, just generally a, a word. It, not the same as the great tribulation as Jesus described, though, in Matthew 24, though, is it? So, they had their trials and troubles back then because they, we know they were under great persecution at the time. Um, you know, unless, unless you've had your hand in the sand like an ostrich, you've got to realize that historically this was a rough time for the church, which is manifest or revealed evidence 
of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. See, he's kind of heading in that direction, right? You guys are going through rough times right now, but hey, God will repay them. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There shall be these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in the saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith and with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our great gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if it's from us, See, somebody's passing around bogus letters. As though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless the departure comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And then he encourages to stand fast, ask for prayers, and he, he warns against idleness and so forth. He warns against idleness because their inclination was, oh, God's coming pretty soon. Where's my robe? I'm going to put my white robe on. I'm going to sit up at the top of the mountain and wait for the Lord. He says, no, no. He says, uh, occupy till I come. I think we should start a cult. Yeah, start a cult. <laughs> right? Con- very... <laughs> Wrap yourselves in sheets and climb up on the yeah, roof. Right. Yeah, wrap yourselves in sheets sheet, and put on red tennis shoes and go lay on them. Yeah. Hey, wait, wait, wait for Hillbop? Yeah, wait for Hillbop. That's weird. Um, so, controversial, controversial passage. Um, but just consider it. There's enough in the Bible to demonstrate a pre-tribulation, pre-wrath, but pre-trib, which is ultimate pre-wrath, rapture beforehand. We've got the Antichrist. He's going to be here for a week, but before that happens, the restrainer's taken out. Is the restrainer going to be taken out of the way without us? Yes. So what's he doing? that don't believe in the pre-trib rapture do with the um, wording of us and them? What do the pre-trib relation no, the people, non, non, the non-pre-trib yeah, people like do? The, oh, with the language in first, uh, in uh, first Thessalonians yeah, 4, the us, us and them, them stuff. If they don't. Um, I don't know what they do with that. Okay. I Really, I don't know. Most of the stuff they come up with, I don't know, they kind of got to read over it or avoid it. 
it's kind of like sitting in maybe a lot of um, Southern Baptist churches now and trying to teach the book of John, the Gospel of John. You got to tiptoe around major passages that just don't work with the popular theology in some of the Armenian type churches, you know. So yeah, right here in Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Chapter two, verse thirteen. Yeah. God has chosen you from the beginning. God has chosen you from the beginning. It's Second Thessalonians two thirteen. Right. From what? The beginning since the time you chose for yourself. What? <laughs> so I gave you something to chew on and to think about. Because what I told you I was going to do before, this and probably Daniel 9 are going to be the most difficult passages to get into. In fact, when we get into Daniel, I don't think we're going to do Daniel in one sitting either to get into the 70 weeks of Daniel. Just understand that mostly what, mostly what Daniel 9 is about is Gabriel came down. He said, uh, there's going to be 70 weeks of years uh, a week is is just a, a period of sevens. sevens yeah. It's a grouping of sevens, and that was just a Hebrew idiom. Clearly, it didn't mean days because that stuff didn't happen that quick and whatever. So you you know it could have been seven of almost anything, but it meant years. And part of that was going to be right up to the time the Messiah comes, and then the Messiah is cut off. Okay, so that was the first sixty nine weeks when you count all the things that Gabriel gave to Daniel. And then there's some events that he describes that happened in one more week of years. And that's the 70th week of Daniel. Those things we're still waiting on. That Those things did not happen yet. Okay, including the man of sin coming and profaning the temple in the middle of the week. None of that stuff happened. In fact, Jesus in Matthew 24 talked about it as if it's still future, okay? Yeah. And he tied a bunch of other things, events to it that we'll get into that will um, define it more sharply. So that's the 70th week of Daniel, and we're still waiting on that. So what is this period in between? Paul spoke in uh, Ephesians, for instance, he talks about the mystery of the church. A lot of mysteries Paul talks about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Acts chapter 2, the church, Jew and Gentile, together being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'll build my church, and he did. So this age right now that we live in, generally we can call it the church age. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. And we're the body, but it's also the church is described as the bride of Christ because he's setting up all that visual type of um, typology, word picture for us to understand how our relationship with him works. So that's why we're described as the bride of Christ. Paul says up to this point it was a mystery. It was hinted at in the Old Testament, but now we're finally living it. This is the church age. We're the bride of Christ. So what that means is that up to the time of the crucifixion where Messiah is cut off, Daniel chapter 9, we have all this Old Testament period, which is the time of Israel. God, by his mercy, foretold even in the Old Testament that there would come a time when uh, it would be a time for other sheep and uh, the Jews would stop believing in him for a season. Romans 9 all the way through Romans 11, but really Romans 11 is really great. Describes this dynamic, how the time for Israel will pick up again. And it talks about a time when we are taken out of the way and Israel is grafted back in. So the dynamic then is we got this time from the time of Abraham all the way up to the time of Christ. It's the time of the, for the Jews. God in his mercy has this 2,000 year period here, the church age, where we get access to Christ to enjoy fellowship with him, be joint heirs together with Christ. Then we are taken out of the way, and then 
we've got this 70th week of Daniel, the prophetic clock starts again for Israel. So the clock stopped a little bit at 7 till midnight, if I can put it that way, for us. This is an, an age of God's grace to the Gentiles. We're taken out of the way, and then the prophetic clock starts again for Israel and their continuation of the promises. So we'll get into more of that if you can catch all that, but that's how the tribulation week shakes out. Lots of process here, right? What we're going to do is next week is Thanksgiving week, and some people might have three-day weekend things, a lot of things going on, family stuff going on, that type of thing. So we'll skip next weekend. The following weekend when we come back, what we'll probably do, we'll dial back the complexity of this a little bit because I know this week was controversial and complex. And if you have any questions or whatever, you can email me, ask me in person, or ask questions again when we meet again. But what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to keep going through some of these passages that are pre-tribulational rapture passages so that you, you're comfortable with, hopefully, mostly comfortable with, all these rapture verses and passages. So that when we start looking at these different perspectives, you'll be able to go A or B, like you're at the optometrist, right? Which looks clear, A or B? So I want you to be able to do that and compare. And um, you guys will be able to tell me what you think. Okay, so we start talking about some of these different perspectives. You'll know, you'll say, wait a minute, but doesn't this over here say this? What do we do with this? Okay, any questions? That was very lecture and I apologize for that. But it's controversial unless you, you know. Did, did it shake anything loose, any cobwebs in your rafters or anything about... Uh, some of the perspectives on this or make did it make you think of any other passages you wanted to talk about or any of the questions you might have it was just one of those great big i i i, I. <laughs> well i think it was good I, I mean i like the way you kind of go through it and, and ask the like duh questions like well who are they taking i mean if you ask yourself i was like oh yeah i wrote myself a little note in there if you ask yourself those common sense questions a lot of times you're like oh okay that makes more sense I mean, if you're just trying to take it all at once, it, it, it's kind of confusing, but I don't, yeah. I don't think you... Well, I'm trying to kind of go slow because, you know, when I went through this Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I had to go slow and break it down and go, well, now, wait a minute. So that's why I was asking the question, well, who is it talking about? Who is the man of sin? What is, okay, that day. That, what's that day? Uh, when is the man of sin revealed? And how do we know it's seven years? And, uh, you know, I don't want to assume anything, so... That's always uh, a bad idea. When she asked, what do people that aren't pre-tribulation or pre-millennial do with we and us? Us and them, yeah, yeah we us and, and us and them, and we all this. It, they always use sheep and goats. It's always, we're the sheep, they're the goats, okay? They always separate them. That works. Believers, yeah. unbelievers. Believers okay. and unbelievers, first Thessalonians 4. But then they'll stop at the part when Jesus comes back at his coming. If, if you're if you're already dead, okay, mm -hmm. your spirit is already in heaven with Jesus. Okay? He's just bringing up your body, okay, when he comes back. But you're already in heaven. Okay, that's what they say. You've already went in front of him and he'll ask you, this is what they say, mm -hmm. he'll ask you, he already knows you're not going to be judged because you're a child of God. You're already elect. Okay? So you don't go through a judgment. Okay? They already, you're already in heaven. Spiritually, your body's there. So your they're saying it's here. the first resurrection then. Your body is going to meet your spirit. And that's and what that's supposed there. to be about. And See? you're already there. But if you're still alive and Jesus comes, you'll automatically be taken. Body. You'll change your body. Glorify your body. You'll automatically be taken with him. At the second coming, right? right. It's when all the way at the end of the second, second coming. coming. Your body, everything will be taken, but it isn't this body. It's a glorified so body. So they don't really, they, how do they, in First Thessalonians 4, then how do they deal with the wrath question? 
They don't deal with it. There's no wrath. Anyway. There is no wrath. Right, right, right. Okay, but then. So they gloss over. The so they just move the timeline a little bit. And say it's second. And they move the timeline and say that it's talking about second coming and, and you talk about wrath and they go, no, 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 no wrath. No. Yeah, no wrath. There isn't. Uh, there is no rapture. There is no wrath. <laughs> right, right. You know, and then when, after you're taken, when his second coming, uh -huh. your body's glorified, you're taken with him. And the remainders, the unbelievers, the goats, are just thrown in the hell. There's no going halfway. You're you're gone. Mm -hmm. You're in hell. And that's how they do away with it. But you don't. If you say wrath, they're like, oh no, there is no wrath. Jesus comes back, takes his people. The rest are left. Go mm -hmm. to hell. Ex except for. The Except for the word wrath is in there. I know. We don't talk about, we don't talk about mm. that. See, that's what I'm trying to get. So that's how they get around. <laughs> you ask the yeah, yeah. us and them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how they get around it. There is no rapture. You don't use the word rapture. Right. It's his second coming. There's no it rapture. It starts with er. Yeah. We just don't. See, they go around it. Yeah. And you don't. That's and you're not questioning. Yeah. Because you're never taught. Harpazo. Oh, harpa. Harpa what? Yeah. Yeah. So you're never taught that. So Harpo marks? What? You know. <laughs> and, you, and they don't even go into the revelation, so you don't. Yeah. You don't question because you never. Because that's all apocalyptic language, so it's just too difficult yeah. to understand. It's symbolic. And see, and if you do, they give you a revelation book wrote by a primitive Baptist. <laughs> so you read his, and it's all the Jesus wins. That's yeah. the whole. Well, I mean, you know what I mean. It's, it's all spiritual. It's all spiritual. It's all, Jesus wins. Yes, go. That's the whole thing. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to explain it. The all male thing. Sure, yeah, yeah. That's how they get around. And so, like I said, that's, that's why we say pre-tribulation, premillennial. The only perspective that really takes a normal, literal view of it, including the words wrath, it's actually in the text. So, uh, yeah. Well, see, that's Strict how forward. I told you. Greg today with this class I have to do a split I have to decide well is the spiritual the right or is this the right you know what I mean because when it's ingrained into yeah. you mm -hmm. like I told him the 26 years I went it was ingrained into me it's mm -hmm. all spiritual it's all symbolism you know so you have to try to start over and do away with all that to start over. Well, obviously your perspective and all your, your learning and reading from all those years is very valuable and very valuable to us and appreciate it. Yeah. Because um, for one thing, it's it it's a lot of reading and stuff, or you know, to, to get all that and pull all that out and put it together. And it's real easy to read a book that's generally about the end times that might even be written from a pre-tribulational, pre-wrath perspective or pre-tribulational, pre um, pre-millennial perspective, I'm sorry, I got all these different perspectives in my head, from that view, all the preview, and somebody might misrepresent what a perspective is when they're writing books, and I've read a few of them that are like, I don't think that's what they believe. I mean, some might, but, you know. Well, a lot of, you know, you read the, the uh, pre-wrath rapture of the church. Yeah. Right, by Rosenberg. Um, Rosenthal. Rosenthal, sorry. Um, I knew it was a Rosen song. Rosen Paul, yeah. <laughs> nice guy. I met him years ago, yeah. but yeah. Well, I think his big mistake, and the whole the mistake of that whole group that, that follows that, is identifying wrath. Yeah. Because a lot of them say, oh, the wrath doesn't really start until the seventh vial. Well, what are those other ones then, you know? Well, and again, as we this discussion we just now had, what do you do with in Revelation chapter 6 where it says, the wrath of the Lamb, and it says it a couple times. It's right. like, oh, behold, the wrath of the Lamb. Wrath. Yeah. Some people will try to say, well, that's the Antichrist wrath. And go, no, right. no, yeah, wrath no, no. You, if you go up toward the top of Revelation 6, who's opening the seals? It's the Lamb of God. Yeah. So pretty much it's His wrath. Exactly. So, <laughs> Jesus wins. Hey! That's what it is. Wow, thank you all for I your, even your patience. My, my so, that's why we're taking... It might seem tedious, and I'm sorry, like, tonight I know it's definitely like a lecture type of a night and very tedious kind of a thing, but we're, we're going to we'll make it more fun. Next time, what we're going to do when we come back, we're going to get into um, the Olivet Discourse, I think. We're going to start. That's very confusing, even among pre-trib, pre-mill people that disagree about how to read that. 
but we're going to see if we can figure it out anyway, okay?